Hi, I'm Brendan O'Kane, and I'm the English translator for Points of Origin, the new collection of short stories by Deldo from Common Press. I first encountered Deldo several years ago for another Common Press project, an anthology called Shicheng, which presented short stories by authors from all around China, uh, each of them representing a different city. Deldo was there to represent his hometown of Shenyang, and uh, the story in that collection also appears in Points of Origin, uh, squatting. Uh, when I first read Squatting, I was struck by a few things. Um, first of all is the fact that it's just a really funny, sharp, well-put-together story, as you'll see if you read it. Um, but I was struck also by how well it avoids a lot of the pitfalls that I see in um, in many other contemporary Chinese writers. It has a clever conceit, but it doesn't belabor that conceit. Uh, it has uh, this examination of the kind of the, the conflict or the, the relationship between the municipal government and the, the general public, but it's not all black and white. And, and by especially by introducing uh, a narrator who's in this class of self-appointed intellectuals, Dildo offers a, a take on this uh, topic that's, I think, original and, and, and much more subtle and, and sharper and, and, and funnier than any other examination of it that, that I can think of. Uh, and finally, I was struck by how well language worked within this story. Um, in the case of squatting, we're going between uh, the sort of official proclamations, so you have that officially used language, and then you have the narrator, who, as one of these self-appointed intellectuals, is writing this very kind of pinched prose, and, and the, the writing in the original is really kind of a, a, a pitch-perfect parody of that style of writing. So I enjoyed reading that, I enjoyed translating it, and um, some time later, when Kama approached me about uh, doing a standalone collection of Dildo stories, I, I jumped at the chance. When I looked at the stories for Points of Origin, uh, as a reader, I thought, oh boy, this is going to be great. And as a translator, I thought, oh boy, this is going to be interesting. Um, translation, of course, is you know generally reckoned to be a, a tough job, even under the best of circumstances. And when you're going from Chinese to English, there are difficulties that might not be present when going from, say, a Western European language to English. Um, the most glaring one uh, is the lack of um, almost any shared cultural background, shared history, shared cultural touchstones. Um, there are things that a Chinese author can throw out and reasonably expect his readers to know without having it explained that you can't throw at an English-speaking readership. Um, there's a, a personal name, Lei Feng. If you say this to any Chinese-speaking person, they'll know who Lei Feng is, they'll know why they should know who he is, and there's a pretty good chance that they'll know that um, this name had a certain resonance in the 1970s that it doesn't have today. Uh, today, perhaps, it's not taken quite so seriously. There's all of this stuff that you can throw out and, and almost shift that burden to your readers. Uh, as a translator, I have to pick up some of that burden, reabsorb it, and wherever possible, um, make these make the necessary background information uh, unobtrusively available to readers. Um, that's particularly the case with uh, with these stories. In points of origin we have pieces that are spanning um, decades, I mean, going from the 1960s really up to the present day, um, and also spanning multiple genres. So in squatting, we have this, uh, not exactly a David and Goliath story, but something that might, might be filed under that if necessary. Um, we have uh, surrealist um, satire in, in say, the, the story of cockroaches. We have uh, high kind of dark psychodrama in imagining the possibilities. Uh, in the last shot, I'm not sure what genre it, it would be, paranoid schizophrenic pulp fiction. Um, and 
and uh, modernist fable and metamorphosis. And then finally, in the title story, Points of Origin, um, we have this amazing tour de force uh, where the story, without giving anything away, uh, spans decades, uh, operates in multiple registers on multiple levels, and um, it's just this really tightly organized whirlwind, uh, so to speak. So finding a way to to make all of that accessible to readers who don't necessarily have a background in Chinese studies or know much about Chinese history um, was a challenge. Uh, sometimes it came down to just a matter of word choice, say, referring to um, revolutionary operas instead of model operas. Uh, sometimes it came down to inserting, hopefully, uh, unobtrusive amplifications. Um, in an old-fashioned romance, there's a mention of uh, the, the writer Qiu Miao, uh, who's known for writing these very kind of soppy romance novels. And so I insert that when the name comes up. Um, and the goal is to duplicate as nearly as possible for, for English-speaking readers the effect that Delgo stories have when they're read in Chinese. But beyond this information gap, uh, which was not trivial, um, there's also a, a fairly significant linguistic gap. Um, Chinese and English are obviously not related languages. They work very differently. There are things that you can do in one that you can't do in another. Um, and one of the features of Chinese that's really pervasive is the use of these set phrases uh, or, or idioms, chengyu. Um, idioms, of course, occur in any language. They're notoriously difficult to translate. But in Chinese, they're, they're all over the place, and they're not really that noticeable necessarily. Uh, in English, if I were to say that, um, you know, I, I have these plans and uh, I want to make hay while the sun shines and strike while the iron is hot, but I'm having second thoughts because, after all, discretion is the better part of valor. If I said that in English, you would look at me funny, at the very least. Uh, in Chinese, it would not be necessarily that remarkable. Generally, these things, uh, I find, simply don't translate. In the case of Delgo, however, he's, he's using these for a very specific effect. He's able to make language, if not a character in his stories, and certainly one of the tools that he uses to, to take the story where he wants it to go. Um, he has a tendency of, of employing language to kind of further emphasize this uncanny, slightly uncomfortable sometimes atmosphere that his stories are creating. And he does that by playing upon the expectations that Chinese readers would have for language, for these set phrases, for the ways that they're used. Finding a way to duplicate that in English was really difficult. Um, and in fact, it was a, a mention of the Irish author, Flann O'Brien, uh, at the beginning of the story, Points of Origin, that suggested to me a way that it might be done. Um, Flann O'Brien has a, a very distinctive style in English. Uh, his first language was Irish, and it's it's been said, maybe by Joseph O'Connor, uh, that whenever Flann O'Brien was writing in English, he did so with the kind of slightly unnatural precision that you use when writing in a dead language. Um, without attempting to rewrite Dialdo in the style of Flann O'Brien, uh, I thought that that might be one way of handling it. Of, of having a style in English that is slightly stilted, slightly uncomfortable, slightly in the uncanny valley, um, without going too far overboard into something that might just come off as bad translatees, uh, might be a way of, of recreating the effect of the original without necessarily reproducing the language of the original. And so it was when making decisions like that, when making decisions of tone, when making decisions of voice, um, which is to say very close to the end of the project, that I first contacted Dialdo. Um, some translators like to work very closely with their authors from day one. Um, 
I, I am not one of those translators. And, and I'd been a little nervous about uh, approaching Dialdo and saying sort of out of the blue, here are my ideas for giving you a voice in English. Um, and I needn't have been nervous. Uh, he was just a, a delight to work with, um, re replied very quickly to all of my queries, gave me really kind of long, useful, detailed notes that um, some of them I, I really wish I could translate and, and, and have them stand on their own. Um, and when I asked him about uh, some decisions, like say putting one story entirely in the present tense, um, he was very game. Uh, he, he understood and, and in fact was enthusiastic about the fact that uh, making the stories work in English would not just be a matter of plugging in dictionary glosses from word for word. Um, and so he was very, very understanding, very supportive, and, and very enthusiastic about um, some of the tougher decisions that cropped up in the process of translation. Um, at the end of it, we have uh, stories that I, I think represent his voice in English as well as, certainly as well as I could do it. Um, I had a great time translating them, and I hope you'll enjoy reading them.